and so it's like super like glaring, <laughs> glaring. <laughs> right now. So you're the Elevate brand partner for December of 2022. You've been on my radar for a hot minute just because it's, um, you know, as an Asian woman working in adult, it's really cool to see other Asian women doing amazing things, but also um, just the fact that you kind of tap into bigger topics that maybe are a little bit intimidating or daunting at times. How long have you been in the industry for and how did you get your start? Yeah, so I've been in the industry, I want to say since 2013, and that's when I started as a sugar baby. But it's funny because I call that like my unofficial start because I never even considered as sugaring like as sex work before for a long time. I didn't like conflate that with sex work. That was something like, no, that's not what I do. Like very much, very, very horrophobic. Basically my start was um, I had a roommate. I, I had gone through a really big breakup. It was a really major breakup in my life. I was really lost. I had basically moved out and my roommate at the time told me about this site because this is kind of around the time where Tinder was blowing up. Uh -huh. remember, back in the day, <laughs> Tinder, <laughs> all that stuff. And she was like, oh, I know you're going on, these, on all these dates and I know you like older guys. So why don't you try seeking arrangement? Because a couple of my friends are on it and this might just be right down her alley and you could go for like paid dates and stuff. But of course, like no one ever tells you the like the sex element part of it. But for me, I was like, oh yeah, let's definitely do it. I want to get paid for going on dates and like going to all the restaurants that I can't afford. Like that would be amazing. So I started doing that for a few years. And then around the time I exited that time, uh, like exited sugaring, I started pole dancing and then started stripping unofficially again. Un everything's all unofficial for a little bit until I can kind of get my footing and until I can really, until it sinks in, until I'm okay with it. So okay. the same kind of thing, like I had an office job at the time and I had done a couple like amateur nights, which is basically like here in the West Coast, I'm not sure if it's different in the States, but when we have amateur nights, it's basically an audition for you to become a stripper. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, like basically. And I had my hesitations because I didn't want to be labeled as such. You know, I, I knew and was aware of all the stigma that came with stripping and with sex work. And I was like, I have an office job. I can't have so much on the line here. But I knew I loved performing. I knew I loved this like really feminine, sensual side. Um, and I've always been an exhibitionist too. So it's like, well, this all just makes sense and this should align. So I finally took the plunge officially and joined the circuit back in 2018. Okay. And this, yeah, and then that kind of catapulted into like me starting my OnlyFans and then the podcast and whatnot. And boy, have I learned a lot since then. <laughs> Do you feel that that was maybe... Um shame or was it more of that you just didn't want to be judged by owning the fact that you know this is what I do on the side is dancing and um sugaring oh everything definitely shame tons of stigma that came with that just being labeled and I mean in high school I was always like labeled a slut and it just kind of like re-triggered a lot of that those kind of feelings and those feelings I really pushed down and those feelings I was uncomfortable with um so for me it was a lot of like oh I'm not sure if I want to do that and but I knew deep down this was something I wanted to do <laughs> but it was really scary yeah aside from being you know labeled did you really have any issues with like what you were doing or did you enjoy what you were doing well a couple things I mean my own challenges well one as both you and I know <laughs> being raised in an Asian household sex work is <laughs> your face yes <laughs> say no more oh yes <laughs> <laughs> yes so you know sex work is not a thing and it's an a, a type of job that you just don't do and you don't conflate yourself with yeah. um, it is 
like the ultimate shame perhaps for many families actually. So that to me scared me and um, I was uncomfortable with, you know, what happens if people find out. Um, but at the same time, I was really open about many things that I did. And I was like, well, I kind of like, who cares if people find out? Cause this is what I want to do. And this is what brings me a lot of joy in my life. And I feel so free when say like I'm on stage or when I'm making videos and whatnot. So I was really struggling trying to let go of that. And it, it was really hard for me to shake that off for a number of years. I know from a Filipino perspective in particular, um, and just from my own experiences with my family and particularly my mom, you know, they immigrated over when they were very young to the States from the Philippines. And the, um, the sense that I got a lot of the time was her trying to separate herself as far as possible from, you know, sexualization because, um, you know, many times people that um, are in the women that are in the Philippines, they would link up with someone from overseas. And that was viewed as desperate according to Filipino culture. Um, and I feel like that's to a degree still kind of the same, you know, shaming other people for coming overseas and particularly if they marry a foreigner or what have you, and like under those types of circumstances. And so I think, um, you know, when it comes to sex work, especially, like you said, it is kind of this ultimate, like, umbrella of shame if you were, as a Filipino woman, to be associating yourself with that, especially if you were raised, you know, in the States or in North America. Is that kind of the same um, uh, experience that you've had with your family? Very similar. I would say it's more back from a religious front rather than shame in terms of like, you know, foreigners and trying to get with them and that being a way out. It's like, it was really fuel, like, especially my mom's side of the family, they're extremely conservative. Like my mom is like a prude. So yeah. <laughs> she's very conservative, like always commented about like, no, I should be like covered up and everything. And yeah, yeah I mean, just comments like that. Um, I knew she would be, definitely really uncomfortable if she ever knew and that's almost like a reason why I haven't been entirely truthful with her either um when it comes to my dad's side um he's half Filipino half Chinese but again still, still coming from a generally a pretty conservative uh background as well this is just uh, something you you don't do but I feel like my dad is more Canadianized to the fact where like we, we kind of had an indirect conversation about quote unquote, what I did, what I do. And um, he says, no matter what it is that you do, just know that I'm proud of you. And I feel like he was definitely talking about yeah. sex aspect of it. So yeah. that felt comforting, but also like it's conversations I can never really be 100% truthful with like two it's yeah. still challenging and uncomfortable for sure yeah like your your conversations can only go so far whenever you link up with your parents or your family because yes. I mean do you do you want to talk with them about it or is it right. or you <laughs> okay well my dad is very like hyper like masculine and just doesn't go to these conversations at all doesn't entertain these just changes the subject kind of gotcha. thing <laughs> very stereotypical male um my mom i actually have had many conversations um with her about sex work because she knows that i have a podcast she's really proud that i have gone so far with the show and, and it's granted me many different opportunities such as this and I've done my best and I'm still trying to do my best in terms of like trying to explain what sex work is to her and for her to gain a better or a more progressive understanding of what that is because I still feel like she has that old school mentality like when you when you think or hear of sex work I ask her I'm like what what do those two words mean to you and she was, she's like oh it means like having sex for money mm -hmm. and you know there as you know there like sex work is a, a very large umbrella and that is only one aspect or one corner one facet of the sex 
work community. So I, whenever I have an opportunity, I try my best to still try and educate her because it's something that's really important to me. And I also want to be true to myself as well. But yeah, having an explicit conversation with her about it is, is hard, but I'm still doing my best because I still think it's important. So whenever you do have these bigger moments then in your in your career and your work, whatever whatever's going on um, regarding your work, are you able to share it with your family at all, or is it? Do you keep it more so for the people in your kind of sex work cir- sex work friendly circle? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty open. I mean, um, back in the day when I was a sugar baby, I actually had used to have a sugar baby blog, right? Be blogging about my experiences, and that was public on my Facebook, connected to my Facebook. Okay. Wow. Okay. And all my family members are on there too. So I'm sure they've probably read some stuff there. And of course I share milestones um, every time like I have a guest lecture or like something I'm excited for in terms of like a sex work festival or something that I'm a part of or have been invited to. I still put that up on my Facebook. So, cause I still feel like it's something that I should be able to celebrate. So I, at this point, I am super solidified in, in who I am. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of what it is that I do. So I really don't care if people have something to say because I'll definitely have something to say to them in, in the hopes to, to educate them further. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the right mentality to have, particularly if, you know, just for, for these types of circumstances too, you can't necessarily rely on the approval of others, you know, to feel like you're, you're fulfilling what, what you want to be doing, you know, or finding your own happiness, um, the work that you do. So, um, so right now you are more so focused on like dancing and creating content. It seems like, um, just from what I was able to find online mostly. (laughs) Uh, Yes. At this point, yes, it's mainly dancing and yeah, digital content creation. So like I have my OnlyFans, I make custom videos and content Uh and stuff and then um that's it for now although I have like dabbled in other spheres that's many of us have done I used to be a dancer back in the day tell me a little bit more about um like the scene as far as dancing right now you know now that we're in kind of this post-pandemic phase what is it like in the clubs and what's the culture like oh gosh well I mean Everyone that I knew that were dancers back in the day, and I have conversations with them now, uh-huh. and we compare money, I've, I've heard it's just not the same. <laughs> like, I don't know if we can really make thousands of dollars a night anymore. I know I can't. <laughs> yeah. That is pretty, like, hard to achieve. At least, I don't know, maybe it's just where I am situated here in Vancouver, Canada. But, um, and also because we're kind of, yeah, kind of going into recession right now as well. There's a lot of things going on. I mean, before the pandemic, yeah, money was good. Um, even kind of post pandemic when clubs were starting to open up again, it was really welcomed. And I think a lot of people were just really tired of being inside and can't go out and restrictions <laughs> and whatnot. So I feel like we were really, really welcomed with a warm embrace and um, I'm continuing to see that, which has really been nice. Um, in terms of like say the online versus um, like in-person type work, like I used to do some fetish work in person, but I, I just don't do that anymore. I am just um, limiting myself now to all my work because it is more flexible with my schedule. I can kind of just do things whenever, like pretty much on my own terms um, and stuff. And then um, I guess the contrast with like in-person, like well, dancing, the only downside to that of course is like kind of being bound by like a little bit of a schedule in terms of like, because I'm a feature, I have specific show times that I have to be on stage for and having to abide by the agency's rules, which I don't always agree with. And there's a whole conversation on like the exploitation of labor when it comes to the strip industry too, which is a very exhausting conversation. (laughs) 
Uh, wow. Okay. So you, you are booked through an agency for feature dances in your area, essentially. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so we God. essentially get um, paid to be on stage to do our shows. And then of course, because we are there, we're also expected to sell dances, which is like basically 98% of strippers everywhere are VIPing or freestyling. So um, yeah, that's the only kind of, again, hesitation <laughs> maybe I'll put it that way uh, just because sometimes there's just really silly rules in place that I don't agree with because um, it's that constant dangling of you're an independent contractor but you have to wear this specific thing you have to show up at the club at this specific time and the list just kind of goes on and on I see. Mm -hmm. I see so it, it, it is kind of like um like a facade a bit uh, of sorts <laughs> it can be definitely yeah but they are I mean it is the benefit going through an agency that you do get the feature shows like if you were to try to book these things independently they might not give you the time of day kind of thing correct yeah, yeah like how it works in the pacific northwest in canada at least and we're just our own unique bubble so british columbia alberta even out towards Manitoba, Saskatchewan area, actually not Saskatchewan, those three provinces, mm -hmm. it's very structured, it's structured very differently. And the rest of Canada is more like the States, <laughs> but where there aren't a lot of um, features, but there's traveling features and that tour and whatnot. But yes, as you mentioned, the draw would be, you get your shows. If you are not part of the agency, then you don't get to go on stage at all unless you're asking the dj at the club can i go on stage for like a, a two song set so oh, okay yeah, it's different structure for sure <laughs> for for the agency that you uh that you work with i'm assuming it's more so like regional shows than not necessarily like going down the west coast of the pacific northwest but it's more um confined to like canada yeah definitely confined to canada and specifically um, well, we call it the circuit, and mm -hmm. you are kind of confined to clubs in British Columbia, uh, so you can travel up north it, within, the t within the province. Some people go out east as well, but generally speaking, if you're on the circuit, you're expected to go travel around unless somehow you get an exemption like I did. I'm not sure how I worked it out, but with the old agent. Uh -huh. He was basically begging me to work with the agency. And I was like, well, I only want to work in these two clubs because I had that office job and I couldn't travel out. I was like, I can work in these specific downtown clubs um, only. Can we make it work? And he said, yes. So. <laughs> wow. So yeah. that's a whole network within itself then. Like if you're touring regularly anyways, mm -hmm. um, then essentially that is the way to to um, build a fan base or build a following through clubs is just regularly touring. Definitely. And a lot of us do tour a lot. Um, for me, again, it doesn't really quite fit with my schedule, um, although it could be fun. But I pretty much for me, I dance regularly at least one one week out of the month, mm -hmm. if not like one to three, one to two to three weeks actually per month, depending on which clubs I'm being booked at. But it's also very physical too. So I'm, I don't know, I feel like I'm getting older and my body's breaking down of injuries. <laughs> yeah, do you do like as much floor work, you know, knee, <laughs> knee I remember back, back then I would, you know, you'd come home and you'd have like mystery bruises all over your shins and your, your knees, like, do you still? <laughs> That's still a thing. <laughs> That's still a thing. That'll be me on Saturday <laughs> at the end of the week. <laughs> so Ed, as far as, um, you know, within the club, the confines of the club and the culture between different performers, then I know online, it tends to be, you know, a lot more of a, a, a community. And would you say the same uh, as such for in-person clubs? Or is there still that kind of like vicious competitive edge that we've heard so much about. Definitely, you no. Know, I would say there's definitely a camaraderie for sure. And like that whole like locker room banter and chit chat in the back, like it really does bring us all together. And personally, I've never had 
felt any competitiveness or viciousness or like what the media says about strippers I personally haven't gone through that but I've also heard that too in some of the Facebook groups that I'm in um, maybe it's more so a bigger probably prevalent issue in the States because the clubs are way bigger out there, like multi-level floors and whatnot. Um, but where I am situated, I've personally never experienced anything like that. Like I only pretty much feel the love. I just feel like everyone wants to support your hustle and, you know, make you have the best shows as possible and support you in that way. Or like, are looking out for you to, in terms of like, hey, uh, that regular is over there. Make sure you sit with him. Cause every time you sit with him, he'll give you a tip for you and he'll tip the girls on stage as well. Like stuff like that. Like I've only ever had really great positive experiences with all the women I work with. So that's amazing to hear. And I, I mean, I guess it serves really to the benefit of everybody at the end of the day to like help each other out. And yeah, because we're all in this together. We all have the same kind of goal. So it, it to me is, doing like a disservice if you are just constantly thinking about someone else or thinking about like oh my gosh they're going to be stealing my customer and whatnot like I just yeah. feel like there's so much like a drain of energy when you're thinking like in that kind of mindset at least that's what I personally feel but to yeah. me I just feel like everyone else in the world is against us so the least we can do is kind of stick together <laughs> in this front. How did that evolve into you know deciding to do more of the online content creation, um, particularly with OnlyFans, how did you decide to make that jump? Because I know for a period of time anyways, especially when I first started um, working for the Streamate Network, there was like, there, it didn't, um, it didn't compute as far as like, well, I'm already in a club, but why do I need to necessarily supplement with this online work? So what kind of pushed you over the edge where it made sense? Yeah, well, for me, I just had fans um, asking me, like, when are you going to start OnlyFans? And again, for me, I guess just classic me, I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't think I have the capacity for this. I just don't have time. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, maybe I'm kind of boring. Like, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. So, but then eventually I just kind of caved and was like, you know what, this is like an, another supplemental form of income. It's not like, it's not like a major source of income for me, but it is extra money in my pocket at the end of the day, which is nice. And something that really solidified that was going through the pandemic. So like a year after I started OnlyFans, it's basically... <laughs> when the pandemic happened and I like lost everything like all of my jobs and I'm such a workaholic so strip clubs obviously were closed um, I'm also a pole dance instructor that closed as well I had a few vanilla gigs that I was doing that all stopped like one of them went, went to remote but then of course like cut cutting down on labor and stuff too so I literally lost everything and the only thing that I was doing at that time actively was my only fans and mm -hmm. I did see a good spike in that and, and people wanting to support and help in that way so like that really solidified my decision in doing that and also just I don't know just having a broader and op more open mind just kind of really narrowed things down in terms of like well there's a lot I can do out there um and just because someone a creator is offering one thing doesn't mean you have to only be confined to that. Like really you can have the creative agency to do any type of work online, really. Um, it really just depends because like, I have so many different fans from different assets or from different areas in the world and different like corners and niches that I kind of dip my toes into. And mm -hmm. they're really subscribing to you. Um, and the content you produce and there, it doesn't always have to be super explicit which for me was the only definition that I had in my mind was, oh, okay I have to get all these toys and I have to put on all these shows and feel pressure that way but a lot of my friends are like I want to I miss watching your live streaming like cooking channel when you used to do that on Instagram back in the day and and the silly things like that 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 like for me really kind of um solidified you know this is possibly the way to go 
So whenever you were first making that transition over and, you know, getting your online uh, like content, um, getting started with that, how did you approach that? Did you do like online research? Were you watching other people do their thing online? How did you, how did you start with all of that? <laughs> I wish I had a more scientific and like prepared approach to okay. <laughs> transitioning online, but literally it was nothing fancy. It was literally myself signing up for OnlyFans, getting verified that way and just figuring things out in terms of like, one, I didn't know what the hell the price my monthly subscription for. So at that point, I started like looking to see what other creators are doing and then um, subscribing to some free accounts too, just to see what they'd be offering. Mm -hmm. um, and that is uh, has honestly been such a gradual process. And even to this day, learning tips and tricks um, from some of my colleagues too, or like collaborating with some of my colleagues too, to continue to kind of like stay up to date with, I guess, not the trends, but like ways to market yourself yeah. and to continue to innovate. So it has been a learning journey, I would say. <laughs> I would say so. Yeah, that's, it's a lot of information to take on, but there's also a lot of information out there at the same time. I mean, what does it feel like um, just from where you sit in terms of knowing just the, the exorbitant amount of content creators out there and, you know, like, um, it, it, is that daunting for you uh, as you, as you aspire to grow your business or what's really your goal as a content creator? Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, when I first found OnlyFans, it was overwhelming to me just because I knew that there were so many people doing it. Um, and this is before the pandemic, I was already like having the attitude, like, oh my gosh, there's so many people doing this. And like, why would they want to subscribe to me? And just questioning myself and kind of self-doubting myself too. But um, I guess as things went on, um, I started to learn a bit better and learn a bit more, I suppose. But it's been, um, I really try to just stay in my lane yeah. and try to keep focused. Because like the minute you start thinking about other creators and like, in a competitive mindset, like akin to what I was saying earlier in relation to the strip club, it, you just begin to lose focus. And we're all here, yes, for, you know, the same goal in terms of making money, but like, we all have different ways about like doing it. And I really try not to compare myself because it is, it can be so damaging. Mm -hmm. And I know my own capacity. I know that OnlyFans isn't like my main source of income. And I know I'm aware of like what you put into it is when you're, what you're going to get out of it. And for me, I am not doing a whole lot. <laughs> I will be honest with that. So that's not the honesty. <laughs> I feel like it's so real though for so many people at the same time, you know? Yeah. It's a lot of work. You know, it is a lot of work um, with editing, with like, you know, watermarking everything and like PPB scheduling, like talking with everyone and maintaining those relationships. I understand why people get virtual assistants. I get it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so with your hand in various pots, then what, what part of sex work do you tend to gravitate toward most or what do you enjoy the most out of all of the various things that you're involved with right now? Well, definitely performing. I still am so drawn to that. I just, there's something about that, that you just, it's not quite the same, say if you're like live streaming or behind a camera or a screen, it's just not the same. That adrenaline, that um, interaction that you get with your clients and people in your like front row and whatnot, like I, love that like I'm addicted to that. it's a really yeah, neat yeah. Yeah, you understand yeah. so like the on-stage presence yeah you really can't I mean that yeah you really <laughs> don't care. so what sparked then the uh stripped by Sia actually you have a podcast but you also have a mainstream YouTube channel as well. So I was watching very closely in terms of your recent travels um, overseas, <laughs> Europe, and I was so jealous of like literally everything you were consuming. Everything looked so delicious. And um, 
So are, would you consider yourself more of a foodie or how did the, the YouTube channel start? Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, I hate that word foodie, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, definitely, you, but yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely a food person. I would probably <laughs> describe myself as a food nerd. So <laughs> I'm just really like nerdy about cooking and just like knowing everything about different cuisines. It's important for me to have like to eat something different like every couple of days. Like, I don't know, it's just really a way of exploring and learning about the world. And of course, if you had the privilege of being able to travel to these countries and learn about the culture and be immersed in the culture, that's like even more powerful and just the best feeling ever. So um, gosh, I mean, the YouTube channel was an idea that I've actually had for a long time. And it was always the same idea, it was always, instant noodle reviews <laughs> I've always wanted to do that because I was like well there's like a thousand billion instant noodles that is a sustainable model I'll never run out there's <laughs> more being made yeah. but I, <laughs> I never had time to do it with my previous schedule before and then when the pandemic hit I mentioned I pretty much lost everything I had all this free time so with the government money that Justin Trudeau gave us <laughs> I went, <laughs> I went to purchase a Final Cut Pro, um, which is like a video software, uh -huh. um, editing software, and taught myself via YouTube how to edit videos. Uh, I mean, it's still pretty basic, but that's pretty much how it started. And I knew I wanted to try to monetize that in a set in like at some point. And like I met that goal last year, so that's kind of fun and really really cool and just something that I've always wanted to do and it's just cool because I, I know that there's people out me that are just nerdy about noodles and uh, the channel speaks for itself <laughs> <laughs> it's fun though I really like it and I wondered I did without like looking does it does your mainstream content go back to your only fans at all or do you just keep those two things completely separate um there it's separate but there is a link to my Twitter, which is very, it says strips by Sia. It's not even like yeah. Sia Slurps. Like that's the only thing that can like lead people that way to be like, oh, you do a couple more things. Uh, <laughs> a couple. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I, you know, the, the big thing that, that caught my eye just while I'm taking my cursory look online is uh, obviously the podcast where you really dive into these bigger topics regarding anything from like decriminalizing sex work to really digging into the humanity of sex workers and those who work in the sex industry. What compelled you to, um, you know, to base those conversations or your podcast around those types of conversations? Yeah, so I have been doing the show for just over three years now. So, and this was, this whole idea came about when I was booked at like my home club and one of the customers there just said a statement. It was something along the lines of like, strippers are like so cool. Like you all have like giant platforms. You have, you know, thousands of followers and you lead such interesting lives. And a lot of the times, like we don't actually like get to even know what those lives are and that just like kind of stuck with me and I was like hmm like you're actually right we do have lives and we're just normal people but like you yeah. know people only see us see us as such so again with the label of sex worker or the label of stripper or whatever it is right and there's not much there's nothing else to that or that's what society might think so yeah. I then was it two weeks later started the show <laughs> but like since day one I knew I had um like the mission was to destigmatize sex work and that was it was just destigmatize sex work but now that has grown to destigmatize sex work through telling the lived um to through telling like the stories and lived experiences of sex workers because oftentimes either like stories that you don't really get to hear about very often and I really wanted to be able to as you said humanize sex workers because we are human these are jobs this is our livelihood and I want to do that through education 
Mm-hmm. So I just feel sometimes people might not have access to sex workers or being able to have these intimate conversations, which are really, really important conversations to have because I really just like want to be able to provide a better understanding of the of the work that we do and of the industry that we're in. And um, yes, it can really be seen as taboo a lot of the time too, but I just wanted to show another layer and just dig a bit deeper because we have so much to share and so much to tell. So that's kind of how it all started many years ago. <laughs> I like it that you said you're. Um, it's more educational because yeah, thinking about it, it, it really is. Um, going back to like putting on your learning hat, you know, you're not purporting to know everything that there is to know, but asking the people that um, that you're speaking with to just share their, and like learning through their experiences, as you said. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's so important too, because like, I will never claim that I'm a master of any of these topics. And that's why I bring people on because they actually know more than I do. And I want to be able to share that. And um, like a lot of times, like people ask me like, well, who's the podcast for? And well, one, one side, it's for sex workers. I want to make it for the community, but also even more importantly, I want to make it for people that are not even part of our industry at all. The ones that hold all these opinions about us and make decisions for us. And I want to be able to educate them and try to change or at least tweak, or at least like spark an idea or something else that like, you know, maybe there's more to these people instead of just the same old, same old that we hear every day. Do you ever feel like you need to um, not prove something, but just present yourself, particularly when we're talking about civilians that maybe do have, that hold stereotypes about sex workers, that you have to present yourself in a certain way in order to be taken seriously? Sometimes I do, and I'll be honest about that, because we aren't taken seriously in most situations. Um, So sometimes I feel like I do have to really strongly come on with this, again, educational kind of perspective, because I've also witnessed people that come in with an angry and a defensive and like ready to fight kind of stance which is okay too, but it's personally not my, my route of choice. Um, Cause sometimes I find that to be like too much and it just causes a lot of this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So sometimes, yeah, like I do feel like I need to be able to prove myself and I really have to provide like a really strong argument. And when I am, when I am faced with those situations or conversations, I take that opportunity to try to like re-educate them or just try to like, tweak their way of thinking because again I'm one person but I don't know I feel like I can maybe perhaps try to make a difference yeah I, th- I think you are I mean even even just by posing these questions you know and and putting out into the ethers um you never know who's listening or what kind of impact that could potentially make on their lives um and who knows maybe they might even learn something by <laughs> listening to the conversations yeah I, I'd hope so. <laughs> so what is your, what is your goal in the long term then? Yeah, I mean, I'm still trying to figure that out, but um, this year I made a point and a goal of mine to actually practice some of the advice that I preach on the show in terms of like getting involved with organizations um, that really benefit sex workers. So I actually just joined the board um, for Living Community, which is a nonprofit organization that does help support sex workers in British Columbia. And I chair the Sex Worker Engagement Committee, which is a brand new committee in terms of like trying to, again, provide the support that sex workers need um, throughout the province. And I also joined another board as well, um, Swan Vancouver, which is another great prominent organization that helps um, migrant sex workers in British Columbia because a lot of times, and this is an episode that I want to do at some point, but I haven't found a good contact. Um, a lot of the times uh, migrant workers, um, especially in sex work, they don't have pretty much any rights 
at all. And because I don't know much about that corner of sex work, I wanted to join the board so I can really gain more knowledge um, and experience about this topic, Mm -hmm. Um, especially because a lot of these workers, um, they are of Asian descent and I really wanna be able to try to help them in some sort of way. So that is a goal for me, at at least for now, for the next two years that I'm gonna be on these boards. I wanna like, again, trying to make some change happen. I wanna really try to to help out in some way. Um, So that's kind of like what I'm focusing on. A little bit right now and then in terms of my career like with the podcast I'm not sure but I know I definitely want to continue doing it because I love having these conversations and there's still so much that I don't know about and so many topics and ideas that I want to like record <laughs> so there's no end in sight for that yet <laughs> so it's the wild west in terms of this industry really so we never know what could be around the corner and what new conversations uh, opportunities for conversations, but um, Red Canary Song is mm-hmm. a good organization that that you could potentially talk to, um, particularly for Asian migrant workers. I know that they, um, I don't know if you remember the shooting that happened at the massage yeah. parlors in yeah. Georgia. Atlanta. I think yeah. that was last year. Um, yeah. But yeah, they were heavily involved in terms of like uh, activism around that so I love yeah that. I will definitely send you a, a contact for that uh, for a future episode yeah. no I, I you know I really appreciate just the work that you're doing um particularly coming at it from such a humble place too I think that that's something that um you know there's just something inviting about that and I think sometimes working in this industry you do have these questions or there are things that maybe you're not familiar with or are aware of so having just kind of open um, conversations like that, um, you know, that it's it's very helpful. Well, if people want to find out more about Stripped by Sia, where can they go? Yeah, so they can find the podcast. Can you imagine any podcast platform, like any podcast platform, it is basically available. Um, yes, uh, definitely Spotify and Apple you want to rate the show and listen and and like review more people can like find the show that way so just want to shamelessly plug that um I can also be reachable on Twitter which is also stripped by Sia as well as on Instagram and my website that I'm working on so diligently it is um stripped by Sia.com and if you want to monetarily support the show I do have a Patreon as well which is patreon.com slash stripped by Sia and that money is actually going towards maintaining the website <laughs> at this very moment. Thank you so much, Steph. It was really good to talk with you. Um, and we look forward to the month ahead for December. Thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> so excited. <laughs>